Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on fire, F-I-R-E. And uh, no, we're not talking about uh, the Army or the Navy, but uh, fire and flame. Now, fire is not always a bad thing in the Bible. It really isn't. So, all right, let's go take a look at the first use of where fire or a flame is mentioned. All right, so in Genesis 3, there was the fall of Eve and Adam. And we read in uh, verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, if he would have been able to live forever, he would have lived forever in his fallen state. Now, a lot of people don't know it, but uh, one of the first prophecies in Genesis 3 was the prophecy of a Savior coming to crush the head of the serpent. But we'll get to that in a second. Verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword, a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now cherubims are some type of angelic type being, but a flaming sword. I hope the Lord uh, gives me one on his return trip here to the earth, because I certainly would know what to do with it. All right, let's take a look at Genesis 3. And uh, in verse, in Genesis 3:15, God speaking to the serpent. And if you read Gen uh, Revelation, it tells you who the serpent is, the devil and Satan. But in Genesis 3.15, it says, And I will put enmity, which is hatred, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And what seed, children? It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, in Revelation 12.9, 12, 9, it tells you who the serpent is. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So in Genesis 3.15, you have a prophecy that somebody would come to crush the head of the serpent. And don't think that point was not missed on Satan. He knew what was coming. So, in flames and fire, the first recorded instance is in chap Genesis chapter 3, very, very early. So, let's, I'm not sure if this is going to be a one or two part study. I know, sometimes I'm pretty long winded, but I like to be fairly thorough. Now, fire sometimes is going to be a good thing, but we're going to take a look at the bad thing. Genesis 19. Okay, if you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So, flaming sword, 
fire from heaven. Not good. Now, let's take a look at something good. We're going to go to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. And let's see what the Lord has to say. All right, so Moses had fled Egypt. And he's out in, oh, uh, let's see. Horeb. So let's look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses and the bu burning bush, right? Now, is this bad? No. Now, the flaming sword was not bad really either. It was just to keep Adam and Eve from doing something that the Lord didn't want them to do. And Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire. I guess if you were a Sodomite, that would be a bad thing. But, um, you know, fire is a very, it's a cleansing thing, really. All right, so let's take a look. Verse 3. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So, and you know what, people? When um, I wasn't sure what to call the Lord when I first came back to the Lord, that's what I called him, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That's what I called him, because there is no mistaking who that is. So, verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large unto unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Oh, yeah, the Canaanites. Isn't it funny? Uh, the children of the devil, the Canaanites, went into the promised land. I mean, Satan had to have known what the promised land was to, to, for him to be able to send his children out there to, to do his bidding. You know, it makes, it really, you know, God must have told Satan a lot of stuff. I mean, how else would he know? But they're there to be adversaries, to fight against Israel and God's plans. Verse 9, Now therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I also have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, what's funny is the Egyptians were of the uh, Ham. Now, you've heard of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem was the promised seed. Ham was the father of Canaan and the Canaanites, but he was also the father of the Egyptians. I don't think I'm going to prove that, but just keep it in mind. 
Verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. All right, let's go to Exodus 9. Moses is confronting Pharaoh. I guess we'll start in verse 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, which is like a disease, pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed, for this cause, have I raised thee up. You see, God raised up Pharaoh. God put Pharaoh in power. Why? And in very deed, for this cause, have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. As yet exalteth thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thy hast in the field, and upon every man a beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire, and the fire, and the fire ran upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail. Hail or hell? Seems a little bit of both, huh? H-A-I-L and H-E-L-L. -L. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field, and brake every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron, and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. Of course, that wasn't enough for uh, Pharaoh. Now, in the book of Revelation, there's uh, something very similar to this in the tribulation period. You see, the plagues of Egypt are very similar to the plagues that happened in the tribulation period. God's judgment upon a sinful, wicked, evil world. Now, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I'm sorry if I seem to be covering a lot of the same material, but a lot of these uh, things are, you know, woven into each other, you know, so you can, when you start covering one thing, it 
leads to another. So, all right, verse 2, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire, filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail, hail and fire, fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. You see, that sounds just like the same language of Exodus. And uh, I have a, matter of fact, I have a playlist on the plagues of Revelation and how similar they are into the book of Exodus. All right, so that was some more fire. In um, Exodus chapter 12, we read about the Passover, where they took the lamb. In Exodus 12, 8, it says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire. So the lamb was to be roasted with fire, not boiled roasted with fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs shall they eat it um usually when uh when i was when i do the uh passover thing the bitter herbs i use uh horseradish verse 9 eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water but roast with fire his leg head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Now, I don't know the significance of that. I I really don't. I don't get it. So if somebody knows, uh, I would be very interesting. Please, interested. Please leave a comment. All right. Now, in we're going to Exodus 13. Uh, this is when they Israel has been left Egypt, and they're getting ready to, and the Lord is leading them. We're going to read Exodus 13. All right, Exodus 13, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto, unto me all the firstborn, Whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. So, evidently, the firstborn was uh, the firstborn son or of the beast. Animals were important to the Lord; they belonged to Him. Isn't it funny? I was the firstborn son of my mother. To my father so I guess that's how it worked out I'm not sure not bragging just stating a fact verse 3 and Moses said unto the people remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt out of the house of bondage for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place there shall no leavened bread be eaten now what was the significance of Leavening, well, sin was likened unto leaven. Uh, remember where the Lord said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees? All right, in John chapter 6, in verse 51, Jesus said, I am, the, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I give for the life of the world. In 1 Corinthians 5.8, Paul writes, Therefore, let us keep the feast, feast of unleavened bread, right? 
Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 16 real quick. Oh, uh, Matthew 16, verse 5. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Two denominations of Jews, right? Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why re reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, but that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And sadly, people, all these people getting into the sacred name garbage and and the hebrew roots garbage uh, it's the leaven of the pharisees that's exactly what it is you know it's uh, what what can you do all right now uh, back to exodus 13. Verse 3, And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. See, once a year, uh, for the week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were supposed to go through the house and get rid of all the leaven in the house. And in the Old Testament, when they were getting rid of all the yeast in the house, the leavening agents, it was, in the New Testament, it was symbolic of getting, taking a personal observation, an inventory, so to speak, and getting rid of all the sin in our lives. So, verse 4. This day came ye out of, in the month of Abib. Uh, usually Abib starts in our late March or April. Verse 5. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he spare unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. Now, let's face it. What, uh, what, is, what else does yeast do besides leavened bread? I mean, that's what you use to make alcohol, right? And... The Bible doesn't say very many good things about drunkenness that I know of. Verse 8. And thou shalt show thy son in this day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign unto thee, and upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt, Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in a season from year to year. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, 
and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, the womb, right? All that openeth the matrix and every firstling that cometh out of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. See, people, that's what Christ was. He was our redeemer. We had a penalty that we couldn't pay, and he had to come and redeem us. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this that thou shalt say unto him? By strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. That was the first Passover, remember? All the firstborn died. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thy hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took up, I'm sorry, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. Now listen carefully. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So that's how the people knew when to, to make camp, because the cloud or the fire would stand still. But when it started to move, the people knew to break camp and to follow it. So the Lord was leading the way in a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire, fire by night. Now, in Exodus 14, 24, uh, the army of Pharaoh wanted to um, come and take the... Hebrews back to Egypt, but God had other ideas. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. So here it is when the Egyptians wanted to uh, grab the Hebrews and bring them back, uh, they had a pillar of fire in front of them. And I don't know about you, but... Uh, I, I don't think I'd want to go through a pillar of fire. Now, let's see. I guess we're going to go to Exodus 19. All right, Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Oh, um, people, um, the, from what I understand, and if I'm wrong, correct me, the, uh, there's twice a year when the length of days and nights are pr approximately the same. It's called the vernal and the fall, uh, the spring and uh, vernal equinox, the equinox happens twice a year. The days and the nights are about the same length, approximately 12 hours. And from what I understand, the spring equinox, 14 days after that is the 
unleavened bread, Passover timing. I mean, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it, I'm it's close. Okay. Now the um, that is the beginning of the Lord's year, the spring. Now in the uh, our calendar, it's the dead of winter, right? Uh, December. You know, they got Christmas and, you know, I mean, really, winter? But the uh, agricultural calendar, you know, spring, that's when you, beginning of the year, when you'd plant your crops, you know, about April, March or April. So when it says uh, the third month, if March or April is the beginning of the year, you're talking summer, approximately. So in the third month, when the children of Israel gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. And they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, where does it, what's this thing about eagles' wings? I, how I bear you on eagles' wings. Did a huge eagle come down and take, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and fly away with them? No, it's a, it's a figure of speech, an expression. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. All right, so where do we have eagle's wings in the New Testament? How about Revelation chapter 12, verse 14? And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, there's that eagle again with the wings. That she might fly into the wilderness from her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So this is telling you the woman, the church, Israel, is going to fly into the wilderness on eagle's wings. Well, you know, basically the same way Egypt did, right? All right. Let's go back to Exodus 19, verse 5. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was reading from Exodus 19. Now, God says, Now therefore, if, a big if, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Did Israel keep the covenant? No. When people tell you, that God made an unconditional covenant, uh, that's only partially true. God made conditional covenants, which means that you have to keep your end of the bargain. And then God made some unconditional covenants, which means it didn't matter. But, you know, there's an unconditional covenant, which means you got to do something too. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Where else does the Bible talk about uh, people being priests? Revelation 1 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 5.10. And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And we're not talking about water falling from the sky. We're talking about reigning and ruling. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, 
that is how that works. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation. And that word generation, uh, first four letters is G-E-N-E, -E, gene. That's where we get the word genetics. You know, generation. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen to that. All right, let's go back. Exodus 19.5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Didn't we just read that in the New Testament? These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded to him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. Liars, you liars. Uh, that's the Bob translation. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the, the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready again the third day. Ah, the third day. Wasn't Christ resurrected on the third day? Oh, yeah. And be ready again against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. Thou shalt not in hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. So evidently, this is some holy stuff. You don't want to go anywhere near it until uh, the trumpet soundeth. Isn't that funny? There's seven trumpets in Revelation, right? Seventh one's the last one. That's when the um, resurrection happens of the living and the dead. Verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. You know, the Lord wants us to wash our hearts. In the Old Testament, they washed their clothes and their bodies, their skin. But in the New Testament, we're supposed to wash our heart. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. In other words, um, no relations, intercourse, if you catch my drift. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And my, Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up on, I'm sorry, up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down and charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. You, in your sinful flesh, you don't want to look upon the Lord. Uh, <laughs> ooh. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto 
And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain, sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. And that was uh, Exodus 19. In Exodus 24, 17, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now, the thing is, um, when you start talking about all the animal sacrifices in the temple, uh, a lot, you know, they were burned with fire. Uh, Exodus 29, 18, And thou shalt burn the whole ram, burn the whole ram upon the altar. altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. A lot of people don't know it, but the word holocaust is means a burnt offering. Now, honestly, I'm not sure if it's Yiddish or if it is Hebrew. I suspect it's Yiddish, but um, Yiddish is not Hebrew, and Hebrew is not Yiddish. Even though they look similar, they're not the same. I mean, they're not. But... That's what holocaust means. So in the temple, the priests would burn the animals. In Exodus 30 and 20, And when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with fire that they die not. They shall wash with water that they die not. And when they come near to the altar to minister to burnt offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And this is talking about uh, the priests that would do this. So, in Exodus chapter 40, verse 38, For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And in Leviticus chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 7. Now, Aaron was the priest tribe. That's what, uh, he was of the tribe of Levi. And so was Moses. The book of Leviticus is the how to do worship the Lord by the tribe of Levi. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. But I don't want to get into uh, the book of Leviticus because, you know, I'm just covering... Some basic stuff. All right. This has been almost three quarters of an hour. Um, I guess this is going to be part one. Um, we'll do a part two. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <laughs>